Classing is really safe me. Certainly, that's not the economic agenda really for them. It is very keen on irrigation uh, uh, and, and that's where it's great as, as a lot of classic technology and also that could serve also as a conduit for people going and I'm going there or to negotiate uh, 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 how we can. No, I, I agree with most of what you're saying. But just to amplify, you know, on the US India side, it's not as though the relationship gets derailed, right? There are all these bilateral engagements that we want. But what you really have is a lack of warmth. And you have the fact that both sides are going to be hobbled to a degree by their own supporters. Uh, I think it's a it's been one of the several mistakes with the Obama, Obama administration and foreign policy. They did not reach out quickly enough. The UK High Commissioner went to see Modi in October 2012, so even before the Gujarat. If I'm not mistaken, Stephen Marker reached out to him as early as 2006. The EU, the Germans reached out to him by January 2013, just after he came back when the one is election in Gujarat. The uh, Americans only went, went, went to see him. So it's been, they've, they've been slow. They haven't recognized something which is which is fundamental, which is that in fact Modi's natural supporters belong to precisely the segment of Indian society most likely to be pro-American. And Modi's biggest opponents in Indian society and India's polity are also the guys who are on the absolutely at the forefront of the burned down effigies of Uncle Sam crowd. So that in the US has they, they, they missed the, they didn't do this right. Uh, I think that the Obama administration is trying to make amends. It didn't have to fall. After all, Sonia Gandhi didn't bother to fall. Uh, but Barack Obama did, so they're trying to reach out. But I think that they're going to have these pinpricks, and partly this is going to be magnified by the media, which really, frankly, doesn't understand that there are all these members of Congress and everyone can get out and have their own agenda. Uh, one thing I think that will change though is that until now, what you've seen is that Modi's opponents on the hill have been far better organized than his supporters. They haven't necessarily had the numbers in terms of, they certainly haven't had the numbers, is my sense is anecdotally, among the Indian diaspora at large. But they've tended to be vocal and very well organized. Well, uh, I think now that balance of power is going to change for the simple reason that Modi has the power of the Indian state behind him. So some of the Hill stuff I think you're going to see, it's not as though the noise dies away, but there is going to be a countervailing force. And I don't think, for example, that he's going to allow the economic relationship to be degraded. So what you're probably going to see is something like, he's not even going to be in a hurry to visit. Uh, I imagine though that you will see a high level US visit either by him or carry. Because I certainly don't think that, even though the U.S. may have neglected this relationship, I don't think that they want to, quote unquote, lose India. So I think there is some effort that's going to be made by Washington to do this. Amartya. So I, I just have a, this sort of thing so is interesting, I mean, just in terms of, Partly a big part of this debate has been about how uh, the minority communities are uh, you know, evaluating what we, uh, what we got. So the optics of, uh, of engaging with Israel, I mean, in terms of is there going to be some sort of restraint coming just from that, that aspect that there's a reason to be at least not perceived as uh, taking too many steps which obviously play very easily into the optics of not really caring. Uh, so that's, that's so that's one set of issues that I think maybe I don't know, I don't know what your view is. This is going to play a big role. I don't. So, sorry. so uh, the, the second one was on this defense of Pakistan. I mean, you just said that this government is less likely to be tolerant of uh, uh, you know uh, events like the gay and so on, so so called terrorist attacks. The issue is what are really the options available uh, for a more uh, robust response to a nuclear armed neighborhood. 
is there, uh, are we likely to see a bigger build-up of conventional things, or are we just looking at more hit for tap responses, which is just going to create uh, along conventional lines, or is this going to be some sort of statement about our, uh, you know, uh, willingness to use uh, the, the, the option or something like that? What exactly do you see as being uh, a way for moving to signal that uh, is not going to sit down? And take um, the, on Israel, I, I don't think that's how they're going to. I don't think that's. I don't think they're going to view it in terms of well, we're trying to build bridges, so let's build bridges by by, by basically playing this way the conference does, which is that you have a relationship, which is basically treat you know you treat Israel as like a mistress and not a wife. Right? That's the heart of the Congress approach to Israel. Post ninety two, of course. Um, you've got to remember, even the Vajpayee government. Itself more on having a certain amount of acceptability in the Muslim community that much by They invited Ariel Sharon to visit. And it's a, if it comes down to, again, ideology, it comes down to it. If you're a BJP supporter, you basically think the idea that a minority has effectively a veto on something which is in the national interest. There's a wide consensus, especially among BJP supporters, but even otherwise, that a close relationship with Israel is in India's national interest, particularly on defense issues. That veto is an abomination. And so I just, I, I just don't see that. I don't see them thinking that way. It's a different question. Do they get, you know, do you invite Netanyahu to be your chief guest at the public day parade? Is it in year one? Is it in year two? You can maybe on the margins. But I think the, the broad idea that the relationship with Israel ceases to be subterranean under a BJP government, we've seen evidence of that before. Uh, we're going to see, we're, we're, I also think we're going to see that again. In terms of Pakistan, I don't, I'm not, I don't think that we're going to see anything particularly dramatic. I don't think we'll see war or so on. But the most clear manifestation of a different policy will be that uh, there's going to be a very clear linkage between and terrorism. You bomb us, we don't talk to you. That's number one. The second is, uh, I would not be surprised if there's some kind of emphasis on rebuilding covert capabilities that were wrapped up in the late 1990s. Um, I think Mughal had a question. So I had a related question, which is what would muscular response, uh, not part of Pakistan, but China I mean, I, I get the point about Canada and Macron and the states. Uh, what, you know, in a surface like financial, if there is a discussion, there is a competition, what are the <coughs> There's no competition. Uh, it would be a military response. It would be a clear, it would be a clear indication to the Chinese that it's in their interest to maintain the status quo, not to be provocative, and that if they were to try something precipitate, that India would like to retaliate. I think that's. I think that a lot of that is going to be uh, in terms of in terms of posture. The other part of it, of course, would be that in, in terms of the kind of alliances. I imagine that's going to be a, that's, that's a, I don't know if a more overtly muscular Indian position is going to be enough to deter the Chinese, given Chinese posture, not just to be in Southeast Asia and South China Sea and so on. So I don't know if it's going to work, but I think it's almost, uh, it's almost going to be a given that that being a new posture. Yeah. I'll do a two finger on this one. Um, China on, on uh, this India question on the uh, South China Sea is actually uh, less of a unified actor, right? 
Uh, it may be that the push on the border, and I don't have any side story, may, may be pushed off by the PLA. Uh, same as last year, it's different from the Japan dispute, right? That's all politicized. Uh, and, and the rest, there's other parts of the Chinese decision making, particularly around the prime minister or even around the top leadership, that sees the India China relationship as a critical strategic relationship. Particularly, anything in global governance today uh, depends on much closer links between India and China. Uh, say the Briggs Bank, which has the potential for unleashing. A lot of other things, including pressure on ratification of the IMF voting agreements by the Congress. Right? So there are people we see that, and therefore we see this critical opening between China and India. Um, and so, if if the new prime minister uh, targeted a top leadership engagement in China early on, it could end up having a huge dynamic impact where where the where the top leadership. Trumps over the PLA thinking, and then you see a decline of territorial uh, incursion and a bigger focus on the strategic aspect of things. Do you think any chance of that? And by the way, going to Japan first would deter that. That is, the Chinese would link it, given how tough the relationship between Abe and China is today. Uh, and China sees Abe very, very dangerous uh, terms, right? They see him as a revisionist, a new military extent of life. Um, you know, so that could trigger, actually that could stop that dynamic from happening. Instead, it would create an incentive to the Chinese to uh, push on the frontier with India. So this is a sort of flip side of the question, right? So will you not go to Israel because it might upset the Muslim world? Will you not go to Japan because it might upset the Chinese? Uh, I think the answer is that he, he will go to Japan in any case, uh, regardless of how the Chinese see it. Uh, in terms of, you know, the division between the PLA and the political leadership, I think that's a, that's a, that's a good other point, but I think from a from an Indian perspective, you know, there, there are two ways to look at this. It's like the Chinese sent troops across the border. You can either say that, well, you know, you can't really understand them. They've got this great this internal dynamic going on. It's a power struggle. Or you can say that, listen, your soldiers have crossed the line of them, have, have crossed the have, have crossed the border. It's for you to figure out what you do, and it's for the other side to respond accordingly. So I think the the extent to which you're willing to cut this internal dynamic in China, uh, if you're slack, so to speak, and the extent to which you're willing to view China for effectively and as, as, a, as, a, as, as a unified actor in terms of how it pertains to your own territorial interest, uh, I would say that the balance is going to lie towards the latter as opposed to the Yeah. 
was curious about your uh, discussion about the Indian diaspora. Um, and that is the merits of the case. I'm, I'm not commenting on that. The Indians find that dealing with the establishment Indian diaspora, for example, the State Department headed by an Indian American assistant secretary, and regardless of you know whether Pete Parra was right or wrong, or whether he was just doing his job, all the Indians you deal with in the establishment seem to be more anti-India, regardless of whether that merited or not, than the average white guy whom they deal with. So is it the case that and there's enormous amount of bitterness in the foreign service about the Cobra Gare incident, regardless of the merits of what she did, she said, but, I mean, the way it was dealt with. And there is a generation now of young foreign service officers in the Indian Foreign Service to the current senior ones who have now this resentment about the treatment of Indian diplomats and the way the U.S. tends to. And there's a school of thought saying that if you are a friend of the U.S., they treat you very shabbily, but if, you have, if you're an enemy, uh, the interest of the U.S. pays you is a lot more. I mean, enemy is a bit strong, but if you're not, if you don't time that, then it makes it easier. So, so are you still optimistic about the Indian diaspora and the dealings with the establishment government, Indian government, uh, given all this history now over the last two or three years and the bitterness and the lack of warmth, as you said? A few parts there. Um, first of all, I would say that the there's certainly a characterization in this a certain section of the Indian media, which is that the Indian diaspora is particularly unfriendly. I think that's flat out untrue. Uh, I think the on the contrary, if there is an expectation that Preparara will not do his job just because he happened to have, have ancestors in Punjab, it's a sort of it's a it's almost a, it's a it's a ridiculous expectation to expect people who work for the U.S. government not to represent American interests, they're paid to represent American interests. But I certainly do not see, uh, I don't see them, with a few exceptions, like maybe Bobby Jindal or something. But by and large, I would say that uh, Indian Americans in all walks of life, including in government, uh, in fact, have a great affinity and great affection towards India, and to the degree possible, would go that extra mile for India. So this is a, it's, I think it's a mischaracterization by the Indian media based on completely out of whack la la land expectations of what the diaspora is supposed to do, particularly people who were born in the US. So the truth is this is not that. On Cobra Kale, I, I'm not sure how much long term damage it will you know it'll have. I, I would I say that again on I mean I think I'm one of the few people who sort of pointed out that there's enough blame to go around. And the, obviously the U.S. handled this awfully, completely ham-handed, insensitive, clueless about the cultural sensitivities uh, and the diplomatic niceties that, that, that were involved here. Uh, but I have to say that this also showed the degree to which some of the worst old reflexively anti-American instincts in the Indian diplomatic corps is still thriving. So, Certainly caused damage, uh, lost both. I mean, a lot of goodwill has evaporated on both sides, particularly among the people who have to do the hard work in the day-to-day -day sense. So perhaps it's going to take some kind of uh, a political push on top to get things back together, and we're not we're not going to see that. So my own sense is that on U.S. India, the relationship is deep enough for it to progress on autopilot and to continue on sort of making gains in certain areas. But this is certainly not going to be the heyday of the university relationship as we saw, for example, with the new deal in the moment. So. Yeah. I just had a question about the uh, Canada-India relationship. I think you have comments on uh, future prospects for that. Um, when Adam Roberts from The Economist was here last year, he said that Canada wasn't really on anybody's radar in Delhi, much to everyone's chagrin the crowd. Um, and we are, especially since you know, Canada is negotiating a free trade agreement with India that was supposed to be completed at the end of 2015, it's still ongoing. Um, and you know, Canada has put a real push into becoming involved in Bible Free Drive, as we mentioned. Uh, there's been a head of government and a head of state visit in the last 18 months. Um, will, we, will we begin to see dividends from all that attention and energy that we've put into the Canada India relationship? 
I have to say I was dreading that question. Because uh, I, I know very little about the India-Canada relationship, but just a few quick points. First of all, you're already paying dividends, Modi's tweet. So there you go. But, uh, I mean, Canada isn't, you know, it's not that high up on India's set of <laughs> this is no nice. I mean, I'm not. It's just um, very nice. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, I do think that uh, you know, with the, with the Harper government in particular having reached out to Modi, there is there's going to be a certain amount of goodwill and warmth. And if you look around and you see the, you know, you look at the Western countries, they certainly say that. Canada, the UK, perhaps Germany, other countries which are kind of you know, most likely to have a, a, a strong relationship. But in the end, uh, you know, these things are driven by dominant interests. And so I say, you know, even though there will be perhaps less involved between the US and India, that is still going to remain the relationship that drives things in North America. I'm sorry if that's Well, on the, on, the, on the subject of the foreign ministry playing a greater role in promoting trade and integrating with uh, trade policy and so on, it's a, it would be a very welcome development if it happens. We as a ministry and uh, as a service would be very happy to take it up. Because promoting trade abroad, it's not just a question of uh, holding workshops and so on, but integrating policy and also making policy, including domestic trade policy. So in other words, commerce and trade and foreign ministry really can work together. So if one gets a greater role in, in those terms, it will be very welcome. And this supplementing what you said. Uh, uh, secondly, the, 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 since you brought up the, the very unfortunate incident a few months ago, I think this whole business of diplomatic immunity is not just being understood anywhere across the world. America may be in the forefront of foreign traffic diplomats. Uh, and it's not just been India, it's been the other diplomats who are similarly there. Uh, this very notion of immunities and privileges, which goes back to Vienna and mentioned, it is to enable the diplomat to work it freely, without fear, in a very alien environment. Uh, hence, the small privileges given to him and the few immunities given to him are not, uh, are not exactly favors. Otherwise, uh, uh, a diplomat can be framed on the flimsiest of grounds and, and tucked away in the jail for years together and things like that. And I think that, that is just not being understood across the world and it's falling apart. And uh, either we need a new Vienna convention, we renegotiate or in such time, we respect the Vietnam Convention, uh, not only in letter, but in spirit as well. I think, again, that there's a problem there. They're going uh, by the letter when it suits them. So, anyway, that's the third question. So, this is a question, not a statement, for you specifically. Uh, this thing about uh, uh, Mr. Modi's campaign, his entire uh, uh, politics being misunderstood in the US and, and, and the ensuing uh, uh, situation we have now. Uh, in simple terms, what do you attribute it to? Why has it happened? Is it the media? Is it the lobby groups in in uh, DC on Capitol Hill, as Professor uh, Panagar has said? And what, 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 why has it happened? And uh, how can how can it be how countered? Can, a couple of reasons. I, I think if you were to sort of you know, simplify this, I would say that most of India right now views Modi primarily to the prism of of development. So you talk to people and they say, well, I also, why can't we have roads like the Why can't we have electricity like 24 hours? That's how most Indians view him today. But much of the West still views him primarily through the prison. And that has changed to a certain degree among the business community because they've had a very good experience dealing with them. But it hasn't changed with much of academia and many journalists and so on. And I think that in general, when you are having a virtual foreign correspondent myself, I think the the people who the foreign media is most likely to get excused from in India happen to be among one of the few 
two sections that is the most or is the least reconciled to the idea of a proposing prime ministership, the liberal commentaries. These are not people who are going, the foreigners aren't going and hanging out with some you know, shopkeeper in Southern Bazaar who loves Odi. Hanging out with the uh, colonists for the Hindu who loves it. It's the reality. So the fact is also that uh, the human rights groups are powerful. Uh, some uh, Muslim and evangelical groups have just been, they've been organized around the world in Hindu way back, all the way to the world back over, over, over a decade. So he has very real, very real opponents in India. Those opponents in India are disproportionately well networked with his opponents outside. Uh, his best card in, in, in the US and in the West more broadly is really economics investment development. I imagine that he's going to try and uh, build a road to Washington. <laughs> Well, I would like to get your views on Bangladesh you have not mentioned, nor Myanmar. I would like to link this also with some domestic geopolitical, you know, regional problem. The northeast is our one major area of worry, not only from my order point of view, but also development is not happening. And look, this is the landlocked area. And the people there, wherever the idea has been given, that you should uh, really try to diplomatically press for an eastern window, which involves that, you know, really if you want to have something, say, oh, steel road or something, you know, it was constructed or something like during the war. Now, revival of that, you know, the construction of that has been discussed from time to time, but of an obvious reason. Ministry of External Affairs didn't allow us to move beyond the preliminary design. Now, if we really, and Myanmar, we have neglected the Myanmar. And China has taken the full advantage of it. And you see, the source guide the, you know, the grabbing and capturing the resources, who would have control over the resources of a on geopolitical region, guides ultimately a lot of policies. China, Arunachal has been enough of water and forest resource and also oil and gas. And if you look at the geological data, we are not So, you know, the, similarly, Myanmar has got a lot of resources, including gas, forest, water. Bangladesh, we cannot make that in between, and it has also some resource with gas, which is not being sub. So, an integrated unit about the whole region, we have to get it when we look at toward the east. But first, why don't we look at the near east? And do you think that the both would have any, uh, any uh, already some thought about the issue? Because North is again, from my order point of view, such a big point of view, a very strong area of war. Long war, up to the middle of the southern coast state. To think of. I think it's a long I don't know. I don't know if he has the, the, I, I, I do worry that the, 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 that public opinion in Bangladesh uh, is going to be quite hostile. And it's going to, in fact, put Sheikh Hasina, who is a really a remarkably poor India leader He's going to make things very difficult for Sheikh Hasina politically. Um, not merely the fact that in Bangladesh, like in Pakistan, uh, Modi is viewed predominantly to be in too, but also because on the campaign trail he has very specifically spoken about Bangladesh immigrants, spoken about the demographic issue. The resurgence of the BJP in Assam, where it did very, very well, really can be traced to the set of issues. So, where even though I'd say the campaign on the whole nationally has been focused very deliberately on development, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that that, that probably creates appropriate uh, conditions of some apprehension and even and that awkwardness in the relationship. So that's going to be a sensitive one for him to manage, and I imagine there's going to be some repair work to do with that. But that said, you know, the wiggle room that any Indian Prime Minister has on Bangladesh is quite limited, partly because of Hong Kong. So even when you had a Prime Minister in India who really, 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 truly wanted to make these grand sweeping gestures and fix relationship, and in a sense reward Sheikh Hasina for having gone out of her way, for example, to take on board India's very, very real security concerns in Bangladesh. We seem to forget that not so long ago, Bangladesh was the second front line in terms of terrorism. But even a prime minister, I mean, you could argue that no one couldn't get much of anything that's going to make this stuff either. But I, I would say that there's a, a structural reason, and that's just that uh, states have become more powerful. Modi himself wants to empower states even more. And there's, there isn't that much room to give the Bangladeshis. So the short answer is that yes, I think the relationship with Bangladesh in particular may have may, will likely become more problematic than the Modi, but that's not the only part of the problem. The, the, a larger part of that problem, I think, that's in fact. Thank you very much.